is, this is going to make my other announcement even more funny because the, the communion one. Okay. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Sorry, none of that was planned, or, um, believe it or not. Um, my name is Benjamin. I'm, I'm excited to worship the Lord with you this morning. So normally we, is, we have as few announcements as possible so we can go straight to, to singing and the call to worship. Um, just settle in for two minutes here as we do announcements. I, I have just a couple things I want to mention. The first is if you park back that way and come through what feels like the back door, the office door, uh, that's where the parking lot is. You may have noticed we put signs in the parking lot uh, about parking around kind of an edge to make spots more available to uh, those who are visiting, those who are elderly, those who um, are pregnant or have recently had a child. We just want you to know those are actually for you. (laughs) If you even remotely qualify for any of those, Uh, you you need to use them. Otherwise, everybody else is parking further away. (laughs) And so uh, you don't have to be super humble. And and please just just use those. Uh, That's what they're there for. Um, The second announcement is that we have been talking, I I don't know how to project this year-wise, four or five years about planning a church and uh, in the city. And so if you were at our um, congregational meeting in December, I announced that we weren't two years away from planning a church, (laughs) but we might be six months away from being maybe 18 months away from planning a church. And I know I can do math. They're both two years. But what we, we didn't know what would happen over the next six months. And what I can tell you is that behind the scenes, um, a number of us, Ben Bechtel in particular, has been, been working very hard to think about what it would mean to plant a church, maybe not in 18 months, but, but in some length of time from now. And so next week's service, we're going to shorten the worship service. We're still going to have sermons. We're going to still have singing. We're going to have all that we have. But we're going to give time at the end to talk to you about the church plant. There's going to be a handout. It's going to be pretty. Um, all those things. So we want you to know and be thinking about it. The, the final announcement, and then I'll, I'll call us into worship, um, is related to communion. You can see it up here in front. Uh, we are doing it differently than we used to. We used to just have kind of during the COVID era, the, the little personal things that are in the pews. We're going to ask you to come forward and receive it. I didn't plan enough people. <laughs> I need two members who would be willing to hold the trays. So is there any two? Is, do, this is an unusual announcement. This is why you're laughing at the microphone. But I need two members. Okay, Sam and Jan. I saw the hands first. <laughs> Salem wants to. I'm not going to hand you the tray, buddy. That's my four-year-old. Um, thank you, though. Um, well, to the weak uh, who are tired and need strength, to the wayward, excuse me, to the wounded who are broken and long to behold, to the wayward who are lost and far from home, we welcome you in the name of the living Jesus. If you would stand, I'd like to read from Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. The call to worship this morning reads this way. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And in a world that is crazy, up and down, left and right, our health is up and down, our finances are up and down, our relationships are up and down, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he invites us to worship him this morning. Stay. 
So usually this is a time of confession. We will do the same thing just in a little bit of a different way. We're going to sing a song, and the song's going to be a more of a reflective song. The song is written more as a prayer, and you guys can, the words will be on the screen. You guys can sing along. You can take this time to pray, reflect, um, don't feel like you have to sing.
speak what is true. Speak what is true. Speak what is true. Good morning. My name is Jeff, and it is at this time in our service when we normally go to corporate prayer. And as we do that this morning, um, I just want to take a minute and uh, talk a little bit about um, a book that was put together by a well-known author, Gary Chapman, just a few years ago. It was called The Five Love Languages. And in this book, um, Gary talks about ways that if you are married, if you have a significant other, that you can deepen the commitment in your relationship. Things like words of affirmation and quality time and receiving uh, small gifts and acts of service and physical touch. Those are ways, if they are practiced consistently and faithfully, that can have a significant difference in drawing you closer to your mate, the one that uh, God has joined you to. I have a question for you this morning. Do you know what God's love language is? What, what is it that draws you closer and closer in a solid relationship with the Heavenly Father? Well, fortunately for us, we don't have to guess. Uh, God wrote it down in his book. Um, you can find it in the book of John, chapter 14, verse 15. 
This is what Jesus said to his disciples. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. God's love language is obedience. That's an important thing to remember as Pastor Ben comes this morning to talk to us about Exodus 33 and 34. Because there's a specific term that's used in Exodus 33 and 34 for the nation of Israel. You know what it is? They're a stiff-necked people. They're obstinate. They are self-centered. They want their own way. As we go to prayer this morning, I'm convinced that that job description fits me really, really well. I haven't done nearly as good a job this past week in exercising God's love language as I should have. As we go to prayer, ask yourself, in what ways this week have I shown God that he is more important to me than almost anything else? That's the dilemma that faces the nation of Israel. It's also the dilemma that faces you and me. So let's pray together and ask the Lord to soften our hearts and make us ready for the message this morning. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, when we read in Exodus that the nation of Israel is a stiff-necked people, they, they're straining against your leadership and your care and your love. I, I realize, Father, that that job description points a finger at us as well. Father, we need to be ready for this message. We're gathered here to listen to your counsel. We beg you for your care this morning. We need your correction. Father, we need you. There are people here, Father, who are crushed because of events that have happened this past week. And, and maybe there is a considerable amount of pressure because the finances are, are drying up. We, we don't have uh, what we used to have in, in terms of our ability to... Uh, to buy food. Father, there are people here this morning who are feeling abandoned by their leaders. They, they just don't seem to care. There, there are folks here this morning who are struggling with physical illness. There are folks here this morning who are sad and experiencing personal grief on a scale that's difficult for us to grasp. We are, as Pastor Benjamin described us this morning, weak and wayward and lost. And Heavenly Father, I'm just grateful that you are here to meet us at our point of need. Father, as Moses talked to you and said, for your name's sake, please don't destroy these people. Father, for your name's sake, lift us up and clean us up and Point us in a right direction. Help us to be less self-centered. Help us to take away lessons from this morning's message by Pastor Ben that, that will live with us and will make a difference for the cause of Christ. We're here to listen. We want to be better servants of yours. Father, help us to do that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. As Jeff shared with you, Ben will be preaching out of Exodus 33 and 34. A portion of that will be our scripture reading this morning in Exodus 34, verses 5 to 9. You'll find it on the Pew Bible, page 69. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him, Moses, there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. And he said, if now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, 
please let the Lord go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take for us, and take us for your inheritance. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Kristen. Kids ages four years old through kindergarten can be dismissed now to go to children's church, and they'll join us at the end of our service. Like uh, Kristen said, we're going to be in Exodus chapters 33 and 34 this morning, so if you want to leave your pew Bible open or your own Bible, uh, we are going to be in and around that text a lot, so you're going to want to make sure you have your Bibles open with us this morning. And we come to this text this morning, and as a preacher, I tremble a little bit at this text. This is like the holy grail of the Old Testament in so many ways. And so I am honored to preach it and to be able to spend just a few minutes in this passage with us this morning. But we are all suckers for a good cliffhanger, right? Our favorite TV shows exploit this all the time. Right as the tension in an episode is rising and something major is about to happen, the show stops and you have to wait till the next episode, which if you're watching on Netflix automatically starts playing in like three seconds. So you don't have to wait that long, but I can still remember the day and some of the shows are actually starting to go back to that model of where they make you wait for a week to get that cliffhanger resolved. We love this kind of dramatic tension in TV shows and movies, but we hate it in our own lives. When it gets real in our own lives, we despise that kind of dramatic tension. We hate the days of sitting around waiting to hear back from a job interview or waiting to hear the test results for a given medical examination. We don't like living intention. But last week, we left off right in the middle of the tension of the story of Israel's idolatry with the golden calf. In Exodus 32, Israel decides that Moses is taking too long up on Mount Sinai receiving God's law, so they're going to make a representation of what they think God looks like. God's taking too long telling us what he is like, and so we are going to try to fashion him in our own image. And so they bring God down and change him into something that's manageable and agreeable for them. They commit, as Benjamin said last week, adultery on the honeymoon. But God then invites Moses to plead with him for the people, and God spares the life of the people. And then at the end of chapter 32, where we left off that last week in verse 30, the sin of the people is still hanging over them. And Moses says, I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps he can make atonement for your sin. And that perhaps is where we pick up part two of our story today. Will God forgive the people's sin or not? What will the real unchangeable God do to those who try to change him. And that's the tension not only hanging over the people of Israel at Mount Sinai, but that is the tension that we feel hanging over our lives. Many of you who are Christians this morning feel and know too well your constant, perpetual sin. And so you begin to feel this tension. Will he continue to forgive? Will he put up with me? Others of you here this morning don't trust in Jesus, but you still feel this tension whenever God and your own faults and failures are mentioned in a conversation. What is God to do with us? What I pray that we see in crystal clear vision in this text this morning is that perpetual sinners like you and I, we find our only hope in coming to God as he has revealed himself, as he truly is. 
God delights to reveal his constant and faithful love to hopelessly faithless people again and again. And that's what I hope we see this morning. So if you would, let's go before the Lord in prayer and beg him that he would be with us this morning and teach us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, without your spirit being here among us, we are nothing. And we're here just as a formality. Jesus, I pray that that would not be the case this morning. May we earnestly seek your face in your word. And may you reveal to us that you are good and beautiful beyond our wildest imaginations. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, rather than preaching from an outline this morning, uh, what I want to do is walk through this text chunk by chunk. So we're going to read a lot of verses, or chapters 33 and 34, and I'm going to do that because I want us all collectively to feel the tension in this story as it continues to rise. I want us to hear and feel the orchestra swell growing more dramatic throughout the story, as it were, as we read. And so let's start at the beginning of chapter 33, starting in verse 1, if you'll look there with me. Chapter, Exodus chapter 33, verse 1. It says, the Lord said to Moses, this is while they're still up on Mount Sinai, Moses has gone up to plead for the people. The Lord said to Moses, depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, to your offspring I will give it. I'll send an angel before you, and I'll drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey. Now let's pause there. At that point, we're like, okay. It, it sounds like Moses' is perhaps is, yes. It sounds like things are back on, Right? God heard Moses, and despite the perhaps, it sounds like the, the people are going to get to go to the promised land. But let's keep reading. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, verse 3. But I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments for the Lord had said to Moses, say to the people of Israel, you are a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. So now take off your ornaments that I may know what to do with you. Therefore, the people of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onward. And this is where we all should let out a collective gasp. God won't go with them? This is terrible news. The whole point of the book of Exodus, as we've mentioned several times throughout the series, is not the Exodus in and of itself. The people of Israel were freed from slavery to Pharaoh and the Egyptians so that they could serve the Lord. And not only that, God didn't simply want his people as servants he wanted a real, dynamic relationship with them. He wanted to come down and dwell among them. That's what we saw. That's why God gave the plans for the tabernacle just earlier in the book. God is essentially saying here, when he says, I will not go with you, he's saying, everything that I've said about the tabernacle is off. I will not dwell among you. In fact, I can't dwell among you. And it's as if God is saying here, you can have your promised land, right? I will fulfill my promise to Abraham. I will be true to my word. But this relationship is done all but in the formality of it. And to use uh, the, the, the analogy again of Israel cheating on God on the honeymoon, which we talked about last week, let's think about this in those terms. It'd be like a husband telling his new bride after she cheated on the honeymoon that, that in his kindness, he's not going to divorce her. In fact, he'll even uphold part of his end of the bargain. 
He'll be sure that she's taken care of, that, that she has money, that she has food on the table, that she has a place to live. What's his will still be hers. But, he says, there's no chance we're living under the same roof. Right? And, and the people see this arrangement for what it rightly would have been. It's a disaster. They don't put on any of their jewelry as a result of this word, which might seem weird to us, but that, that detail is a sign of mourning and repentance. And why was it so disastrous? Why, why do the people who were so stiff-necked, as Jeff mentioned before, why do they react to this strongly? It's because they knew that without God's presence among them, they were nothing and had nothing. The whole point of the Exodus was so that Israel would be brought to the Lord, that they would be his own treasured possession, his own bride, as it were, as it says in Exodus 19. The people, when faced with this reality, they repented out of a right hunger to know God intimately. They wanted God to dwell among them, to truly know him. And friends, let me stop in the passage at this point and ask us this question. Is this how you view your life? Do you hunger for the presence of God the way the Israelites did? I think it's easy for us to say, oh yeah, we, we would do the same thing, but God is saying, I will give you all of my good things, I'm just not gonna go with you. And the Israelites rightly say, no, God, we want you. Without you, we have nothing. They were not content with God's stuff. They wanted him. And so, church, let me ask you, is he what you are most earnestly pursuing in your life? Do you spend your time thinking about him? Do you schedule your time and your life around him and his kingdom? Do you plan your investments, both relationally, time-wise, and financially, all around how you and others may know God more? And if not, it reveals that likely we're not desperately seeking his presence in our life. And we could ask the same questions of us collectively as a church. If we gather here on Sundays and throughout the week and God is not with us and does not go with us, we're just playing games. And it's the same thing. We're gonna talk about a church plant next week. If God does not go with us to plant another church, we are just playing games. We all ought to be like David who says in Psalm 63, oh my God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Or in Psalm 42, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O oh God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Church, may we see God as invaluable to us, as he rightly and truly is, that for him not to go with us and not to be with us in all of our endeavors is a disaster. It's a failure. We need him. May our lives show that we desperately need him. But this brings us to another point of tension in our story. Although the people know and desire that God go with them here as they're broken, if he does go with them, as he says in verse 5, if for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. The Lord knows the hearts of the people. That's why he says this. They are stiff-necked. They're like farm animals on a yoke who refuse to pull in the direction that the farmer is leading them. He's trying to lead them one way, and they constantly try to buck against him and go the other direction. 
God knows that for him to dwell among his people, that that he would consume them because the golden calf is not a one-off incident. The golden calf is indicative of all of our hearts as human beings. We have hearts that perpetually worship something other than God or try to change God into someone or something that he's not. In other words, we're perpetual breakers of the first and second commandments, which we should all be familiar with. So how do you feel this tension? How is God to live in close relationship with a people that's going to constantly turn their hearts from him? How can a holy God stay in a marriage with serial adulterers? Let's keep reading in the drama of our story. I'm going to bounce from 7 to verse 9, then verse 11. So follow along with me the best you can and try to bounce with me with your eyes there. Verse 7, it says, Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And when Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. So Moses has come down from Mount Sinai now, back to the people. And he comes down without a clear decision from the Lord on what he's going to do with the people. But although this is confusing at first, what happens is that Moses takes a tent and sets it up outside of the camp of the people. Now, just for clarification, that tent of meeting is different from the tabernacle, which is confusing because if you read uh, in other parts around this, this part of the Bible, you'll see the tabernacle referred to as the tent of meeting. But, but this was a separate tent that was set up kind of in the in-between stage. Uh, they set it up in this interim time period. But notice the one detail that the text wants to really stress to us about that camp, I'm sorry, about that tent in verse seven. It's outside the camp, far off from the camp. God has still not given his people a decision on what will happen to them. The diagnosis has not come back yet, and the tension in the waiting room is palpable. God is far off. And notice, though, there is a glimmer of hope here. Moses has favor with God. Moses speaks to God as a friend speaks to another friend. Let's keep that in the back of our minds. Let's keep reading verse 12. Moses said to the Lord, so this is Moses communing with God in that tent of meeting. Moses said to the Lord, see, you say to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. And consider, too, that this nation is your people. So after this brief recess... Moses picks up the negotiation with God again. And in verse 12 there at the beginning, he says, Moses says, God, you haven't told me yet who you're going to send with me. So he says, bring up the people to the promised land. But he says, you haven't told me who you're going to send with me. Which is interesting because if you remember back in verse 5, which we read earlier, God says, I'll send my angel out in front of you. So what's Moses doing here? Well, I think Moses is intentionally drawing upon the language of Exodus chapter 3, verse 12. When God met Moses at the burning bush, God promised that when Moses went up, God would go up with him to free the people from Egypt. So Moses is saying, God, if I have found favor in your sight... And if you are going to be true to your promises, you have to go with me at least. And he also says, not just me, there at the end of verse 13, 
He's not just worried about himself. He says, consider the people too. They're your people. Go with them as well. And the Lord hears his request. Verse 14, we'll read down through verse 17 here. And he says, that's the Lord, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. And this is where the tension starts to ease a little bit, where we can start to let out a sigh of relief. God says that for the sake of his friend and his mediator and his servant Moses, that he will go with the people, that everything that Moses has asked, he will do. And notice this dynamic here. We've talked a lot about God and Moses interacting, but we haven't talked about the nature of that interaction. That Moses prays for the people and God seems to respond to Moses. And I think it's easy for us to come to this text and read it and think that God is reluctant to grant his mercy. Like somehow Moses has to like draw this out of God and God's just trying to indifferently keep him at bay as long as he can until he finally says, okay, Moses, you win. But I don't think that's what's happening here. Benjamin mentioned this last week, but God is practically begging Moses to intercede to him here. God is making concessions to Moses Moses finds favor with God. Why? Because God wants to be interceded to. He wants to show his people mercy. He's chomping at the bit to forgive his people. And he willingly and excitedly welcomes the prayers as Mo- of Moses as an opportunity to show the people more of who he is. And before we move on from here, And before we get to God granting all of Moses' requests, I think we have to pause for just a second and zero in on the nature of Moses' prayer. We would be remiss if we went through these three chapters and didn't say something about prayer. What would happen if we were a church that actually prayed like Moses did? If we actually believed that we had the ear of God like Moses does. Moses clings to God here like a hungry wolf clings to its food. That's how he prays to God. It's like when Jacob was wrestling with God and said, I will not let you go until you bless me. Moses believed that his prayers mattered and had direct implication in his people's lives. Church, do we pray like that? You and I, by virtue of Jesus Christ, our high priest, have access into the very throne room of God, the same place that Moses stood. We have God's ear, and God invites us to intercede to him on behalf of others and our world. I pray that we would believe and be desperate enough to start praying like that. Moses is a model for all of us in Christ who know we have the love and ear of God to pray to him like that. But Moses has one more big request for God. One more thing that he asks of God in verse 18. Let's read verses 18 and 19 here. Moses said, verse 18, please Show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. 
Now Moses asks to see the glory of the Lord. And I think Moses asks this because he wants to know more of God personally. I do think that's why he asks. But I think there's a deeper reason why he asks. I think he asks still with his people in mind. So let's think about what what has God said and not said up to this point in the dialogue with Moses. So at this point, God has now promised not only to send his angel in front of the people to give them the promised land, and not only to go with Moses himself, but to dwell with the people as he has promised before to truly take up residence with them. But there's still a problem. You remember, given the inevitability that his people will turn again to other gods or try to change the true God, how can they know that God's presence among them will be a good thing? How can we know as people with the same hearts that produce countless false gods, that God's presence in our life is a good thing to bless us, to not consume us? How do we know that God will continue to forgive as he dwells with an obstinate, stiff-necked people? That's why Moses asks to see God's glory. You see, Moses knows that the only hope for faithless people who try to change God. The only hope for those people is found when we come up against the unchangeable goodness of the true God. See, Moses asks to see God's glory in this moment because he knows that only in the depths of the true God, only by going down to his unchanging heart can we find the solution for our sin. Rather than exchanging the glory of God for something lesser, our only hope is to see the true God in all of his glory, in all of his goodness. And this is precisely what God does in the climax of this passage, in verses five through nine that Kristen read earlier. God invites Moses up to the mountain, and he has Moses cut two new tablets for him to place the Ten Commandments on, to rewrite them on. And he invites Moses up to the mountain to renew his marriage vows. And he reveals to Moses his glory. Let's read those verses again. Exodus 34, starting in verse 5. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with Moses there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. And he said, if now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. And God said, verse 10, behold, I am making a covenant Before all your people, I will do marvels, such as have not been created in all the earth or in any nation, and all the people among whom you are shall see the work of the Lord, for it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. Church, that is your God today. We could say so many things about this glorious name and about God's glorious character, who he is most deeply. But I simply want to draw our attention to one thing, and that's the contrast between thousands and third and fourth. God's faithful love pours out of him for generation upon generation, so much so that we cannot even count or keep track 
while his anger, which he legitimately and rightly has as part of his character, lasts for only a third and fourth generation. In other words, God's default disposition towards perpetual sinners is faithful love. And God here, by disclosing himself, is reassuring the people and all of us that in the depths of our sin and idolatry, what we need is not what our flesh tells us we need. We don't need to run from the true God to another God or try to change him. In our sin, like Moses, we need to go deeper into the true God and his unchangeable heart of love for us. Our idolatry and sin are actually an occasion for us to know him more deeply than we did before. God says in verse 10, I will do marvels such as have not been created in all the earth. This is the people that saw the exodus happen. They saw plagues. They saw the, the Red Sea come crashing down on the Egyptians. And God says, you haven't seen anything. They will know him more deeply because of their sin, because they ran to him, because they come to him. Because God and in the core of who he is, delights to reveal his constant and faithful love to hopelessly faithless people again and again. And the clearest picture we get of this character of God that, that eradicates the tension that hangs over our life is the cross of Jesus Christ. Because on the cross, Jesus shows us that God by no means clears the guilty. Jesus willingly absorbs the wrath of God towards our sin, which he rightly has there on the cross. He does not clear the guilty. All the sin of generations that was passed over is taken there by Jesus on the cross. And yet on the cross, he also reveals the depths of God's faithful, committed love to his people. A love that proclaims to us, till death do us part. And then he rose from the grave and he sits now as the son of God in power. And by the Holy Spirit, he declares to anyone this morning who would come to him, his eternal and unchanging name and character. If you come to Jesus Christ this morning, he declares his name over you, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. No more tension. No more questioning whether he has enough mercy for our constant sinning. That is his unchanging heart for you. It will not change. And you can know that today by running to him and by looking back at his cross and up to his throne where he declares himself to you. I want to close this morning uh, with a sort of parable that Pastor Dane Ortland uh, tells in his book, Gentle and Lowly, which I know many of you have read. Um, so I'm going to quote him at length. and Listen to this kind of parable that he tells here. He says, A compassionate doctor has traveled deep into the jungle to provide medical care to a primitive tribe afflicted with a contagious disease. He's had his medical equipment flown in. He's correctly diagnosed the problem, and the antibiotics are prepared and available. He is independently wealthy and has no need of any kind of financial compensation. But as he seeks to provide care, the afflicted refuse. They want to take care of themselves. They want to heal on their own terms. Finally, a few brave young men step forward to receive the care being freely provided. And what does the doctor feel? Joy. His joy increases to the degree that the sick come to him for help and healing. It's the whole reason he came. And how much more if the diseased are not strangers but his own family? Now, this is where he tells us the meaning of this parable. 
so with us and so with Christ. He does not get flustered and frustrated when we come to him for fresh forgiveness, for renewed pardon with distress and need and emptiness. That's the whole point. It's what he came to heal. He went down into the horror of death and plunged out through the other side in order to provide a limitless supply of mercy and grace to his people. Church, what we all need today more than anything else in all of our sin, sin as wretched and horrible as the Israelites at the base of Mount Sinai, and what Jesus wants from us more than anything this morning, despite what your sinful fears and intuitions might tell you, is for you and I to run to him and to see in him the heart of the unchanging God. Don't resist his heart of love for you. Dare to believe that he is as good as he says he is right now this morning. And when you come to him, you'll find that his love swallows up and drowns out the pool of other gods on your heart. You'll have to keep coming back, but he has fresh forgiveness every time because it comes from the depths of who he is. And when you come to him, you'll find that he embraces you the way that he embraced Moses as a friend. And so, if you doubt this today, if you doubt his love towards you, if you doubt his heart towards you, if you doubt his capability to continue to forgive you, that's why we're going to come to the Lord's table this morning. Communion screams to us and reminds us of God's unchanging heart of love. And in this meal, God is inviting you to meet with him and eat with him as a friend. And so if you say this morning, I am a great sinner, but Jesus is a great savior, and you run to him, then this table is for you this morning to come to Jesus Christ. If that's not what you'd say about yourself, if you're still reckoning with the claims of Jesus, uh, if, you're, if you don't think that you're a great sinner and aren't convinced that Jesus is a great savior, then, then I would humbly ask this morning that if, as we take the Lord's Supper, just stay in your seat and think more about who Jesus is. Think more about what you've heard this morning. Maybe even call out to him in prayer if you've never done that before and ask that he might reveal his heart of love to you. As we come to take communion this morning, uh, just a few logistics. Uh, whenever you're ready, the band's gonna come back up and play a song quietly. We'll ask that you come down the center aisle to receive communion uh, and just hold your hands out. We'll put a piece of bread in your hands and then you'll take a cup of uh, juice from the other person who's serving and you'll walk back out, sit back down in your seat and then we'll wait till everybody's received communion and we'll take it together as a church and remember the steadfast faithful love of the Lord together. If you're somebody who who uh, who has trouble um, getting up here to the front to receive communion, please just make eye contact with me, try to flag me down, and I'll be sure to bring communion to you. I'll invite the band back up, and let's, uh, let's come before the Lord in prayer. Jesus, we thank you that for our unending sin and need, you have an unending supply of mercy and grace. Thank you that we know that based on your cross. And Jesus, I pray that you would help us now to let our guards down and to come to you and receive. In this meal, Holy Spirit, press, impress Jesus upon our hearts and minds. And may we know his love. It's in his name we pray.
This bread and juice proclaims to us who our God is and in the broken body and blood of Jesus Christ, who he is for us in all of our sin. And so on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and broke it and he gave thanks and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Church, the body of Christ, broken for you, taken faith. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Church, the blood of Christ shed for you, taken faith.
in Exodus 34, verse 8, after Moses comes face to face with the true God, he has an involuntary response. The text says that he quickly bowed his head to the ground and worshiped. We have seen the real and true God in his word and in the Lord's Supper. And so church, we're going to sing one more song. May we bow our heads in worship in response to how wonderful our God is. Would you stand with us and sing? Oh
God tells us in his book uh, from 2 Thessalonians, verse 16, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Church, go this week and feel comforted by God's love and for him sending his son dying for our sins. You're dismissed.